It's a great pleasure to, to welcome our, our closing panel, who has the, uh, I guess, the unenviable task of trying to pull all this together. But I think uh, hopefully the progression has made some sense. And, and we get to hear from the folks who are really making these decisions from the equity and owner position, really understanding how of all this information, how energy performance is really going to factor into how they make decisions. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome as a moderator and, of course, as a, as a co-chair for the conference, uh, Chuck Leitner. Uh, Chuck, I think, as most of you know, uh, is, uh, is uh, chairman and CEO of uh, the Greenprint Foundation, which has been really led the charge among global real estate firms to, uh, to gather and collect and analyze energy performance and carbon uh, data. Um, it's a tremendous database that spans not only the U.S., but uh, globally has a tremendous portfolio of, uh, of buildings in the U.K. He's also chairman of REEF, which is, of course, as you know, global, uh, the global real estate uh, arm of uh, Deutsche Bank Asset Management, uh, and uh, after being its global head since uh, 2004. Uh, he's also a trustee of the Urban Lands Institute and a trustee of the University of Pennsylvania, so another uh, a Penn alum, so it's always, uh, it seems to be a bit of a party here today of, of the Penn alum, but uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Chuck Leitner. Well, thank you for that intro. Um, I will not uh, afford the same favor to my colleagues on the panel. We're going to jump right in since we, uh, as Constantine said, have the, uh, the challenge of wrapping up a long day, and I know you've all had a very long day. Uh, we only have an hour. Uh, and we want to keep this active and engaged and try to, as Constantine said, tie some of the things you've talked about and heard about today together uh, from the perspective of property ownership, which we think is really what, what sort of differentiates this panel. Um, so I'm not going to introduce the panelists. Uh, our bios are all in the, in the brochure um, if introduction is required. I think this is a great group and introduction is probably not required. So uh, we're going to jump right in to, uh, to the topic. Um, there's an old uh, real estate uh, adage that I haven't heard there very much lately, but used to hear all the time when I first got in the business almost 30 years ago, and that was real estate and good property is all about three important principles, location, location, location. What this group is going to talk about today are, are three very important principles around um, what we think um, generally uh, is the key to getting this sustainability aspect of real estate into the mainstream, and that's value, value, value. So um, we really want to talk about um, the owner's perspective on value. We want to talk about um, the issues, um, both pro and con, around the linkage between value and sustainability in general terms. Uh, we have agreed not to spend any time uh, on the taxonomy of performance measurements. Since you've heard a lot about that already today, um, we're going to make some assumptions about that. And one assumption is a huge leap of faith, but I think as this room over the last six or seven hours is evidence of, and I think as the conversation that's going on around the industry is further evidence of, we're not as far away from getting that taxonomy right as we were a couple of years ago. And so we're going to make an assumption that we've gotten that taxonomy right, that we've gotten the measurement standards, the performance metrics, the technical aspects of, of those things right, so we can start talking about what the industry can do with that information. So we're not going to spend too much time on data, and we're not going to spend too much time uh, on how you accumulate data, what the issues are. Uh, we're going we're to really talk about how the real estate industry has to make the assumption at some point that the data is right, that the benchmarks are right, and that the measurement and comparison opportunities are right. Now, I know somebody earlier today talked about real estate professionals not being rocket scientists. Uh, I'll go one step further and quote a colleague and friend in the industry that said many, many years ago that real estate was invented for the C student. And, um, and, 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 and I use that a lot, actually, because it's relevant. I think what's important uh, when you talk about this issue, um, there's a lot of technical aspects to it, obviously. Um, I've not met anybody in the business that does what I've done for the last 30 years that can compete with the people that really know the science of energy and the technical aspects of energy. What the industry needs is a very simple, reliable way to use it in their decision-making process uh, around investing and around ownership. So, so that assumption is not, is, is not made just for convenience. It's really made uh, to make a point that we, we're getting there, but we've got to get to the point where standardization of all this happens and that the industry can rely on the technical aspect without having to 
dissect it and take it apart, because believe me, most of us are far from capable of being able to do that anyway. So the other assumption we're going to make today is that, and this one's an easy one because I think the industry's gotten there, is that the financial side of the equation in terms of measurement, performance standards, disclosure, transparency, benchmarking, perform relative performance is a given. And the good news is we're close to that. And so, uh, you know, there's not a person, I don't think, in the real estate industry today uh, that doesn't believe in some form or another those things are critically important. It doesn't matter if you manage your own money, manage your family's money, manage your pension fund's money, manage public shareholder money. Um, the, 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 the need for standardization has arrived in the real estate industry a long time ago, um, and, and it's taken a long time to get it right, but we're, you know, we'll never be 100% there, and there's certainly markets around the world where we all know that we're not as far along as we'd like to be, emerging markets as an example. Um, but that's an important distinction, important fact, we think, as we get into the discussion today, because those two factors really are going to make the correlation argument and debate uh, much easier to do. And I think one of the things that we've noticed as a group, as we talked and prepared for today, is that, you know, you know healthy debate about the drivers of value is really important. Um, we have to have the skeptics in the room. We have to have the owners that don't believe it, don't want to believe it, are afraid to believe it you know, talk about why. And I'm, we're going to ask our panelists to do a little bit of both today. As Constantine said, we've got people that represent ownership, um, a lot of ownership in the New York market, but ownership uh, nationally and in, in many cases internationally. Uh, that ownership is in the form of office buildings and apartment buildings, mixed-use projects, retail, um, lodging, etc. cetera. So, so we've got a really good cross-section uh, from the ownership side. We've got uh, representation from the valuation industry, which we think is critically important as a service um, to the industry, not just in the form of valuations relative to borrowing money, but valuations that really play a factor in that performance, uh, financial performance measurement in those metrics. And then lastly, we've got one representative uh, of many uh, in what I sort of call the supply chain of the, of the business. You know, w where are the technology providers weighing in and plugging in with real estate owners we have Cisco here today. There could be hundreds of others that we could bring to this conversation in terms of innovation technology, getting it to market, and that market being ultimately the real estate owners. So that's a little framework for the group up here. And, and we're going we're, we're gonna, we're gonna to also try something a little different, I think, from what everybody's done already today. We've got two mics here. We'd like to be interactive. Okay, I'm going to start asking these guys some questions. We're going to start getting some debate going. They're going to take some counterpoints, even if maybe they don't believe those counterpoints, just to get it going. But if you have something you want to talk about and you don't mind standing for a minute till we get through what we're talking about, come up and stand by the mic during the presentation. And I'll get to you and we'll try to work in questions and thoughts that, that you have along the way rather than wait till the end because my guess at 3.30 is we're not going to get a lot of excitement about Q&A. So, so uh, happy to do that. If, again, if you don't mind standing by the mic for a minute or two. So uh, let's get started. Um, I, I don't want to shortchange my panelists, obviously, but again, their backgrounds, I do think, speak for themselves. We've got a great group. Uh, I'm going to kick off and ask our three owners uh, at the uh, panel to uh, take about two minutes each um, and give a sentence or two, uh, one of which is a positive, sort of supportive comment about uh, why the link between sustainability and property value, shareholder value, equity value, whatever you want to take as a perspective, uh, is, is important from a positive perspective. And then flip the switch in another sentence or two and talk about a, a less positive, let's avoid the word negative, but a less positive sort of challenge around why the, the obsession with that linkage or the trend toward making that linkage maybe is problematic in terms of their business. So we'll start with Suki, who's got a perspective from Vernado, and, and ask you to get started with those two comments, and we'll go from there. Sounds great. Thanks, Chuck. Um, on the positive end, I'll say that, you know, uh, Vernado, uh, unlike Related, as a public company, we have a, a unique shareholder base, uh, largely international shareholders, um, who have been asking about this for several years now, probably since 2007, 2008. Um, and have really started to use energy efficiency or sustainability issues as a proxy for good business management. Um, and I'd say within the last few years, every couple of months, I get a call from our, one of our investor relations people that say, you know, TIA, CREF, or, you know, any number of our investor groups, large investor groups, want to sit with us and talk to us about what we're doing in our portfolio to make sure that we're addressing key, what they see as risk issues. 
Um, so on that end, you know, there's a direct, I think, driver from the investor base. Um, and on the flip side of that, in terms of the revenue side, um, the same markets that we're in, which happen to largely be, you know, markets where the regulatory environments are much more strict, um, and the electricity and the energy markets tend to be more constrained, New York, D.C., California, um, the tenant base themselves have started to ask for these things. So the drivers for us have been on both ends, and I think the, the trend has been not just clear, but because of that, I think our senior management has been very supportive. So that's the positive end of it, which is that we're getting it on both ends of our business, um, of our core business. Uh, in terms of the negative piece of it, I'd say where you're not seeing a whole lot of traction are people that are not in Class A plus office structures um, and who don't have a public consumer base. Um, so if you don't have shareholders and you're in um, a non-Class A office sector within the United States or in the middle of the country, um, the large perception of this is that it's a cap, we're already capital constrained. Um, and the last thing that people want to start doing is looking for a sustainability director or an energy efficiency person to start asking them for more capital allocation for stuff that they don't have money for. I think that's where we are. Okay, great. Let's, uh, let's go to Wendy and talk about uh, a different perspective, private investor managing, um, managing okay. some investment capital for others on a private basis with the Rose Company. Thanks, Chuck, and uh, please do not let my children know that um, we are C <laughs> students. I yeah. Mine have already figured it out, um, sorry. So, <laughs> um, so um, our firm uh, is a little over 20 years old, and we've been doing green from the very beginning. Um, I like to say we've been doing it back um, when it was really limited to people who were tree huggers. But for us, it's part of best practices in real estate. Um, we uh, specialize in two product types. One is affordable housing, and the other is Class B office. So, sure. where are that other cats and dogs? Um, <laughs> for us, so the positive thing is for us, um, energy efficiency and the broader part of greening is really it's about risk management and it's about running your buildings leaner and meaner and improving net operating income. Um, and the affordable housing side the money you put into it is not going to raise the rents. The rents are regulated. So every dollar that you put in has to go to the bottom line, um, has to have a relatively short-term investment payback, um, and it's a hedge against increases in, in uh, energy prices in the future. Um, on the Class B office side, it's about making the buildings nicer, and of course, um, but it, you don't get a higher rent for ha making the building greener. But what we have found in both contexts is because the buildings operate much more efficiently, and because we get third-party verification for our work, that on an occupancy level, um, we outperform our competitors in the market. So higher occupancy, by as much as 10 percentage points, that's higher um, NOI and clearly um, goes to uh, long-term value. So for us, it's, it's what we do, we, um, it's, and it's not just about capital improvements. It, it's about what you do to operate the building on an ongoing basis, and it's about engaging your tenants, which um, was alluded to on the earlier panel, which is a whole other conversation because it's different messages for different people. Sometimes it's an economic incentive. Sometimes it's an educational issue. Um, so that's the positive. The negative is, I think, less so now, but certainly still there, people equate green with high tech um, kind of a, a luxury spending. It's kind of a nice thing to do. And that's really not what green is about. If you practice green the way we do, which is spending your dollars very wisely, it's really about um, long-term value. It's less about solar panels. Um, they work in some parts of the country, less so in, certainly in New York. Um, it's really about the insulations, it's the boilers, it's the windows. Um, it, there are a lot of things you can do. and. If you think about it, if you didn't call it green, those are all things that a real estate owner should be focused on. Okay, thanks, Jeff. If you could wrap up the first round of oil and comments. Well, I do have one uh, very important critical uh, characterization. I got C pluses. In <laughs> just let's make sure. We, I didn't say we, we got Cs. I okay, just so was talking about the industry. You know, we can Google everything now, so I assume you know. Um, so first of all, as far as the uh, the advantages, I think, you know, certainly very sophisticated people have already spoken on a couple of the major issues associated with risk management. And, and from our perspective, uh, clearly best practices and, and the demand side. But from our perspective, we see it almost as a brand expectation for any organization that sees themselves as, as a leader 
in sustainability. So that's, you can't hide from it. it you can't uh, put just you know, green on your logo and, and, and assume that you're, you don't have greenwashing risk. You really do. Uh, the transparency of the data will make it very obvious and it'll be very embarrassing very soon for those who are um, claiming things that aren't evident in the data. And I think that's one of the great parts um, of what the city has done in New York and what other cities have done as far as uh, requiring uh, transparency in the data. When we get the taxonomy that we're not going to talk about right, <laughs> there will be clearly um, a whole bunch of buildings that are seen in their marketplaces as sustainable or have claims to being sustainable and are, um, and are frankly, energy pigs. And so there's a tremendous brand risk, and so we see it as, as an expectation of leadership that we are focusing on this. Uh, secondly, there are um, the downside is uh, something that was was mentioned, uh, I'm sure, in the in the panel discussions. But for whatever depth, a lot of the information is coming out and and uh, is focusing on whole building, and the owners are going to take all the grief over the usage of the tenants, and that's not going to be clear to the consumer, and it'll be clear to everybody in this room because you're in this business. Uh, but the consumer won't understand that 80 percent of some buildings' usage profile is occupant usage and not the base building. And that the base building is working very efficiently, but that's not the reporting standard. And so there are very, very serious risk factors and, and uh, <coughs> compromises and, and things that we're going to have to work through from a communication standpoint as, as a brand, uh, because uh, that, that is a serious downside. Okay, great. We're going to come back to that and a couple of other points that uh, our owners have made. But just to get our other panelists warmed up, we're going to switch over to the appraisal side of things and ask Thede to talk a little bit about um, what she's seeing and, and, and doing from a real estate appraisal perspective um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of its impact on this issue uh, and certainly its impact on value. So uh, I've got some detailed questions for her, but again, maybe Thede just give a sort of a positive and a negative from the valuation industry perspective just to get things going. I'm thinking about the positive. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Um, no, I mean, I think there is increased awareness, but I think the greatest challenge, uh, even though we're not going to talk about data, <clears throat> is that um, the U.S., and I think the investment as well as the appraisal community, are pretty data obsessive. And um, uh, you used to hear a phrase in valuation call analysis paralysis, but <clears throat> today I would say that a lack of data is creating a certain level of paralysis in the valuation community relative to their um, ability to view uh, these high-performing buildings um, objectively. And where I see the greatest challenge is it's not hard to figure out what the costs are but there is a real lack of understanding about the longer term benefits and the different types of benefits and the currencies of these benefits that can be achieved in high performing buildings. Mm -hmm. So um, there is positive, but it's a challenge. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you on the data thing. Just to make it clear, I didn't, I, I'm not hands off on data from a real estate data point of view at all, which is critical to the valuation process. Um, and again, we're making the assumption that the energy data and the, in, in the environmental data is right. It's not that we can't talk about it. We're just assuming it's right, and we don't want to debate whether it's right or wrong. So, so just to clarify, we can talk about data. We just, I just don't want to take apart the energy side of it, okay? So let's, let's uh, make a quick change over to, again, what I probably in, inappropriately call the supply chain for the real estate industry. Uh, since doing this thing with Greenprint for the last couple of years, it's been a, uh, a very eye-opening experience for me to just really start to appreciate and understand the challenge of getting innovation and technology to our market. And uh, Cisco and others like Cisco have spent a great deal of time thinking about this in, in the context of buildings, in the context of cities. And, and Gordon, you're spending a lot of time on that from Cisco's perspective. So you know, maybe you could again you know, sort of lay out you know, negative, positive sort of challenge from the perspective of a, of a, um, a support industry to the real estate industry perspective, specifically uh, in terms of Cisco and your, your, your involvement with data and information um, and connecting networks? Well, the negative side, I think, is a little easier to describe because it's such a fragmented industry. And because of the lack of standards, which we depend on to build networks and to connect our networks to all the other builders of networks, uh, when, when Cisco started, there was no TCP, IP standard that we use 
for all of our uh, communications now because the internet protocol is the standard. We wish, we wish that was the standard and we hope and pray and are working hard to make that the standard for all the systems and buildings that monitor and sense and ultimately help to manage buildings that are uh, significantly reducing their carbon footprint or their energy footprint or their water footprint. And we're working hard to develop the solutions and work with third parties who are developing their solutions. And so you'll see us partnering with Johnson Controls and you'll see us partnering with Schneider Electric and you'll see us partnering with Control 4. And we've built an ecosystem of companies. So, so we're taking the fragmentation which we understand because the in, in information and communications industry is plagued uh, by fragmentation, but we've, we've built standards with our competitors that enable that industry to become so successful and internet-based communications and information flows to be so dominant. So the bad news of fragmentation is frankly for us a great opportunity because we know how to deal with that. And what we want from you uh, our customers or our future customers is we want you to tell us what applications and solutions and innovations should be built on the network because the building plugged into the network uh, whether it's a wireless network or a wired network whether it's our network or somebody else's network we don't care because all the networks talk to each other so now you have to tell us are you mostly interested in transforming uh, the HVAC systems and being able to manage them and monitor them and understand them intelligently in real time? Is that your highest and best priority for the immediate short term because of your costs, because of what the tenants are telling you, because of what your shareholders are telling you, because of public pressure on the consumer side? Uh, so we're listening very carefully to that. Uh, we're building solutions. We're partnering with the solutions providers. Uh, we're moving up the stack because we're not just going to depend on our building networks. We want to build other others on top of the network. So Relina and I are part of a team, for instance, that have pilot projects in cities all over the world. And if you have a project that you think is an interesting opportunity that could be a pilot or a demonstration of some of those new innovations that can be plugged into the network, talk to us. But there are a, a thousand providers that want to talk to you about solutions some of which are untested, some of which are not scalable, some of which are really not replicable. They're good in one building, but maybe not going to be replicable in other buildings. Uh, and some of them don't transfer from one type of building, uh, one type of real estate asset to another. So we're spending lots of time, lots of money, and employing lots of people to figure out what's going to work best that you don't need to become an expert in our field. And maybe we don't need to become too expert in understanding how real estate asset valuation works, which frankly is physics to me. But I, I would like to be able to see the bridge between us worked through carefully and quickly enough by Greenprint, ULI, and by other organizations that we're working with so that it's easier for us to channel our expertise into your decision making and vice versa. Uh, and that's, that's not easy because we work with different language systems and we have different indicators and different metrics, but I think we're getting there pretty fast. I think we're getting there a lot faster than we thought. Okay, okay thanks, Gordon. Let's stay on that theme for a second while it's fresh um, and, and, and go back to our owners and, and get a quick reaction to, to Gordon's comments, which is, you know, I, just to lead the witnesses a little bit here, it's like, okay, this sounds great, but how do you really access this? How do you ma mainstream it? Uh, how do you work it into your daily business of owning and operating a building? So let's just start with Suki on that. Uh, I kept nodding my head when Gordon was speaking because what he said is exactly right. And the, the opportunity that we see is really the nexus between the technology infrastructure and the world that's evolving to what we do on a normal basis because there is a disparity. Um, we just had, uh, when you talked about IP infrastructure, so we, We've just started to roll out an IP backbone infrastructure in our existing buildings portfolio here in New York. I know and we'll, I was going to talk to you about that. Yes, and we should, we should definitely talk after this because I was nodding my head because I was making a mental note that we do have a pilot that we'd like to work on. A small donation um, to NYU for that, uh, for that arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it, the truth is that as you look, you know, 20 to 30 years out and as we plan for cities and we, we plan for smart grids, the real, the real need is to take existing buildings to a technology infrastructure that makes some sense. Open protocol, making sure that the equipment that you want to be talking to each other can, and doing it in a secure way. And um, you know, we, we literally just had a meeting last week with um, our controls folks at one of our projects 
talking about IP backbone infrastructure. And the issues that we raised were issues that our providers, frankly, had never thought about, right? One of the things that, you know, we can't deal with is security issues, right? And the question I asked was, what are new buildings doing? And they asked, everyone said, well, new buildings aren't even doing, doing IP backbone infrastructure for equipment, right? They're still doing Cat 5s for BMS systems, which to me suggests, A, that we're probably a little bit behind in terms of new construction design, but secondarily, it means that existing buildings have a long way to go in terms of understanding what the risks are and then building an infrastructure that makes sense. But if you're really going to get to a smart grid at some point, all those pieces have to come together and everybody has to agree what that basic, you know, the basic construct looks like. Um, and we're on the fr very kind of front end of that. I mean, there's a long way to go. Okay, great. So let's just uh, go to Wendy, maybe a different perspective again. Um, Gordon, nice guy, interesting guy. Cisco, cool company, but so what? From uh, your perspective? We actually, we love Cisco. Are you aware we're working with you on? Oh, yes, okay. So, so let's we talk. Lo we loaded the deck here. Yeah, yeah okay, I guess okay, so. Okay, okay. <laughs> so let's talk about how um, technology can deal with the day-to-day -day operations of the building and tenant behavior, because that's a really important component. Um, it's about, I mentioned before, a lot of it is about educating people, making them aware of their behavior and the impact. So um, we are actually working with Cisco right now on a very interesting project. Um, we have a terrific affordable housing project in Newark. Senior citizens, um, we applied for a HUD grant um, with, Cis uh, with Cisco as one of our partners to, the building is master metered. So we're trying to figure out, could we come up with something that would allow us to transition the tenants to direct metering so that they're actually, by seeing their bills, um, will change their behavior. Well, as it turns out, um, New Jersey, as with a lot of other jurisdictions, that's illegal. You can't do that. They're concerned that somehow by doing this that you're going to gouge the tenants. It's clearly not the case. So we're instead working on something that's a little more creative. But we're going to be putting in essentially what I would call smart plugs um, in the tenants' apartments and we're going to give them um, regular information about their um, energy consumption and give them the ability to control um, some of the appliances and their behavior. Now, because the building's master meter, there won't be a direct economic impact for them, so we'll have to come up with some other way of incentivizing pizza parties. Um, but what we have found is people are not motivated just by um, their checkbook. They're also motivated by the, just ma make, making people um, informed is really critical. Um, we've seen that in the office context. We have an office building in Seattle, which is also um, not submetered, but we put in um, a building dashboard on a floor by floor basis. Tenants can see on a real time basis energy consumption. Um, the, they actually call us and say, Are you aware there was a spike? Maybe there's something wrong with the steam system. It is but you have to be continually uh, focused on it. It's, it is, um, it's an ongoing process. But I think the technology on the smart plugs, which is relatively modest in cost and very scalable, is a terrific way that technology will be helpful to all of us. Okay, great. Let's go to Jeff. Jeff, can a company like Cisco do anything for a company like Related? Well, I'm afraid they already are. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, yes, we're, we, uh, we have a very diverse for portfolio for those who are not familiar, um, everything from office buildings to affordable housing to retail strip shopping centers to mixed use buildings and in, in 15 different states with about, I don't know how many different ownership entities. So we're, we're not a REED and we're not, um, we're not a single class of, of building and, and so standardized anything is extremely difficult for us. Um, at the same time, the, the, the challenge, and I think there are many benefits to uh, a standard infrastructure and getting an industry together on an agreement as to what that would be, it brings me back to VHS and, and, and whatever the hell the option was, beta tapes. But um, it's going to be a fight and there are going to be some big players in, the, in, the, in it and you don't want to make your decision too early because you could be left with the beta tape. So that's number one is to uh, standardizing, which uh, you got to decide where you're going to uh, play your cards. Number two, there's a major risk to, to uh, what every, every development company is asking us, all of our development companies, we have different product types and all of them have their own uh, leadership. Everybody's asking the same thing, which is, okay, how do I future-proof our buildings? 
and to that that terminology is just so broad that it's almost unbearable to try to put your arms around it. And we have tried any number of times to quote unquote future proof our building. So we'll build a class A residential building four or five years ago and we'll put in the, you know, whatever we spend extra to core drill and put in cat whatever it is, um, and NID boxes and, and non exclusive agreements and fifty different players and it's an open architecture and it's the best thing that anybody can think of and it'll be great for the next, you know, fifteen years and four years later it's obsolete, nobody's using it anymore and so it's a very frustrating exercise because you're talking about infrastructure. Infrastructure is a significant capital cost, and it's not a bridge with a 100-year life. So what is its life? And we don't know that. That's what, I'm just characterizing some of the, the, um, the reluctances to putting forth real money over standard practices across portfolios. Okay? So with a singular asset class and a singular ownership structure, um, you have the greatest likelihood of moving forward with that. And the more diverse the product type, the more diverse the ownership structure, um, and frankly, you know, just the, the access to capital, a whole series of other things. It's, if it's not singular, it's going to be very difficult to standardize at all. But future proofing is very, very tough to invest in. Okay, let's, let's take that comment, Jeff, back and, and get us, ourselves back to sort of the ABCs of real estate, the uh, science of real estate. Um, investing and, and valuation, which I appreciate your comment, Gordon. I'll tell my children that you're impressed with <laughs> what I do for a living that might matter because they, they're, they're more impressed with Cisco than they are with the real estate business, I'll tell you that. But um, so, so let's go back to, to real estate values. And, and let's, you know, take Jeff com Jeff's comment about sort of future assessing these things because I think that is what the real estate investment market does for a living, right? We, we are all about sort of forecasting where values are going to go, we're about investing and owning buildings that appreciate in value or lose less value in a down market like the one we've just uh, just survived. Uh, so we are in the business of future future betting, um, future investment assessment, uh, risk adjustment. So so let's let's talk about the ABCs a little bit. Uh, some of the you know the, the the hot debates that have been around the market. You know, if my building's greener, does it sell for a lower cap rate? If my building's greener, does it lease for a higher rent? And I'll ask Didi to, to weigh in here as well, um, because my feeling, I guess, is you've got to dig a little deeper than cap rates and discount rates and, and, uh, and rental rates. You've, you've really got to look at um, the nuts and bolts of what drives value. And I was fortunate enough early in my career to learn that real estate uh, performance really um, was driven from an inside-out view on, on a property. Uh, and that we've heard it a lot today, and, and, and it, it shouldn't get discounted. Uh, ultimately, the, the most important driver for real estate is whether that property uh, is attractive, appealing, and useful to the people that occupy it, one way or another, whether they live in it, whether they work in it, whether they eat or drink in it, um, whether they come and shop and leave. And so, um, so, so what, you know, what is happening um, if you could start, start, maybe Jeff will just start with you, and then we'll ask you to weigh in. What is happening in your analysis of a piece of real estate, whether it's you know, you're considering buying it, you're considering uh, renovating it, you're considering selling it, um, you're refinancing it, what have you? What, are you starting to apply metrics um, that relate to some of the things that we're talking about? Well, two different, two different parts of the same question. Number one, uh, the financial modeling, which goes to the the, uh, the simple issue of NOI. Uh, you know, what are the real operating costs? Um, what are the opportunities to to uh, manage those operating costs more efficiently and still deliver the services that are expected? And how do you position the asset against what the the uh, the price point is, which is a, more of a brand consideration and and is uh, very very distinct in in different markets for different asset classes. So the first one. Um, goes to a major question of, of uh, valuation. And we do quite a bit of acquisition of existing assets, particularly for affordable housing and workforce housing around the country. Uh, and we have actually no problem whatsoever with seeing the acquisition of an asset as a, a huge opportunity for energy improvement uh, investment. Cost of money these days is actually quite low. The returns, which are um, debatable, uh, though we found them to be not really very debatable, um, are very much higher for energy improvement um, investing than, than the cost of capital to do it, and therefore you're, you're accretive to the value of the asset. Uh, so every one of our acquisition exercises looks to uh, reduce the cost of energy with capital funding. 
Uh, that capital funding could be part of the source and uses from our lenders, and it could be in equity. But in any event, uh, it's a perfect opportunity to make serious change happen, and, and we have you know, significant uh, experience in reducing operating costs on energy usage by 20 or 25 percent on acquisition um, each time we buy a building that, that is in a high energy use area. So that's, that's number one. Uh, so you're creating value from the, from the issue of energy improvement, and that's, that's a standard practice. It's what we do every single time. We go on the property, it's the first thing we look for. It's like so easy to do with the cost of capital being available at a, at a refinancing opportunity. Second is um, the issue of sustainability as a, as a value enhancement to the renter. Does it really uh, add value to the person who's, who's uh, going to pay you rent, whether it's a commercial tenant or, or any other occupancy? And the answer to us is, has been the same basically for a number of years, which is on the margin, all other things being equal, yes. Uh, now, that just means that if there are two equivalent buildings, we're managing it in a sustainable way, and we're using um, what, what uh, people would consider to be standard, what we call best practice, but some people call um, green practices, then people like that. Uh, so if somebody says to us, well, why don't we have, uh, as an example, we decided to do smoke-free on over 100 of our buildings uh, that we've rolled out so far, and our marketing people were very concerned about that, because how do you decide where the value is to the non-smoker versus the lack of value to a smoker? and how many of them are e of each one, and who's not going to move in because they want to be able to smoke in the apartment, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe that the sustainable practices are manageable and valuable, and that each of them is no different than a fitness center or something else. You can decide how much it's worth, but on the margin, it's, it's definitely a decision criteria as far as we're concerned. Okay, we'll go to the other owners in a second, but maybe we'll stop uh, stop at Thede and get an appraiser's perspective on this. Uh, you know, our, our, one of the data issues in the market for all of us has been the lack of transaction data, generally speaking, relative to the uh, overabundance of transaction data we had, um, you know, pre-2007. And so, so talking about data, again, in the, in the, in the real estate context, um, you know, what if, if, a, if an owner investor like Jeff is saying these things matter, um, you know, how, how is the market um, actually showing that uh, with, with, a, with a relative low supply of sales to support it, low supply of leases that would support it, um, and frankly a lot of noise around attribution of those sale prices and, and lease rates that are very hard to cut through and allocate a tribute to green type uh -huh. factors. Just give us a, you know, a, a valuer's technical point of view on that. Um, I don't know how technical it'll be, but I, I think there is uh, a good amount of data that, data that is available from an operational perspective. Uh, without sales, you'll hear a lot of pushback because, as you would be aware, valuations are based on what has occurred in the market. It's not, uh, it is to a certain extent ex opinion, but it's more about analyzing uh, market trends, market transactions, et cetera. Without sales, if you have the opportunity, and, and as you have your own track record, you know, you can look at this. Lenders, you know, investors will look at that and see what information is actually available. And one of our greatest challenges uh, in the valuation profession is that we know all the buildings have operational data, but most owners consider it proprietary. So, you know, trying to access this has been a great challenge. I've worked with Chris Pike at USGBC. I'm working with Cody Taylor and George Hernandez at DOE, uh, both of whom have access to tremendous amounts of information, which I think would be very valuable to my community. But how you're able, how they're able to aggregate that and maintain confidentiality has been one of the greatest challenges we've had. So in many, in certain areas of the country, in the Northwest, California, um, now more so in New York, particularly because of greater transparency, we'll have access to that. And we can make comparisons, one building to the other, based on those factors. In other areas, it's not as prevalent, and that results, unfortunately, in evaluation as pretty much uh, a non-starter. No data, no difference. So I really focus on the differences between the properties, and that's where I think you're really going to be able to see where the value enhancement occurs. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you a little bit, okay? Just not, not, not as picking on Thede, but picking on the appraisal industry generally. Um, you know, <laughs> what, what um, which is fun to do from time to time. I actually I started my career as an appraiser. So one of the things that appraisals and appraisers do and need to do and have done for a long, long time is define things. 
And so, for example, what, what is a Class A property, mm. right? What is a investable or investment grade property, which doesn't necessarily, in my mind, mean Class A, because uh, there are plenty of people here that invested in Class B and Class C and uh, done very well right. doing so. Um, so, you know, it is one of the things that the industry generally, but maybe specifically the appraisal community need to do, is come up with new definitions. Because to me, these things, as Jeff talked about, and we've heard a little bit here, are becoming part of how you define invest, investment grade, class A, class B, um, and, and we just have, you know, 50-year-old definitions for those things. I, 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 will, I will say my piece, and then I'll come right back at you. Okay, uh, good. Is that fair? Um, the moderator I, can always play. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> it, it absolutely is changing, and I think you use the word, and it's been used all day today, which I think has a whole different um, definition, so to speak, and that's performance. What should performance really characterize? I mean, it's not just NOI. It's, it's any number of factors that I think are related to more sustainable or best practices, and they're not necessarily incorporated now. Uh, I work with a development company in the Northwest called Girding Eadland, and about four years ago, one of their major developers made the comment, if a building isn't at least lead gold, it shouldn't even be considered Class A. And, and I don't necessarily disagree, but it's all the factors that go into that um, uh, that would create a different value perspective. From my position sitting you know, in the industry and trying to help, one of our big challenges is education. You, you listened to the different owners and everyone had a different approach on how they would, you know, what they would do with technology, how they would handle that, which could enhance value. But when you have uh, basically a moving feast relative to, quote, market trends and what owners are doing. It's a very hard thing to develop a consistent approach to how these should be defined. Um, my question to you, and this is uh, a quandary for me because um, as a valuer, I'm going to be, um, what I do will be to a certain extent dictated by market demand, just like properties. So how many of the owners here are demanding that their valuations include specific factors relative to high performance, energy efficiency, I hear not very many. Right. Yeah, I think it's a fair question, and, and I think you're right. Um, and I think there are varying degrees, at least from my perspective and experience, about, of owners who, who uh, think it's their responsibility to help educate the appraisers on what's important to them. And, and again, in a, in a transaction robust environment, we've all just been able to sit back and look at transactions. And now that we've spent two or three years in a transaction light environment, and you know, although things are probably getting a little bit better, we're going to be on a relative basis in a transaction light environment for a pretty long time, it seems. And so that back and forth to sort of change the way you look at things is important. It's not just important for somebody like Reef, who clearly manages other people's money, and marketing to market is a big part of what we do every quarter or every year. Um, and so the appraisal part of it is really, really significant because you're not going to realize a return on your investment if the valuations don't pick up, you know, accretive value, uh, you know, at the at the you know at the base you know, of the of the of, of the ownership of the property. So it, it's a fair point. I think let's take it one more step though back to you and you know, Jeff talked about just his his analysis of smoke free versus uh, first versus smoking. I mean. You know, do you look at a building, if you were appraising one of those buildings, would you say, wow, the market for smoke-free is actually better than the market for, um, you, know, um, you know, a smoking building? And so there's a different cap rate or there's a, there's a higher um, tenant retention or there's a quicker lease up rate. I mean, are those things showing up well, in, the, in the process? I, I don't know if they're necessarily showing up. Or should they, maybe? Well, well I mean, I think the question would be, should Jeff's they? Jeff's saying they should. You know, should they? I mean. Again, okay. he's got a track record. He has data that he can show where it's been to his advantage. Um, uh, there's a building that I'm working on a project with in Seattle that is a living building, which right. means it's totally in, uh, sufficient unto itself. Right. It didn't have parking. Right. It got a traditional appraisal that really discounted it for not having parking. Right. Absolutely. But As it in should. The, well, <laughs> in the Seattle market, not such a big deal. Right. I mean, this is all very locationally specific. Location right. still does rule in that regard, right. but it's what are the trends in that market. And the other thing, um, point I think that you need to understand about valuation, value is, uh, for the most part, we look at what is termed market value. I don't know if going forward that will incorporate all the different factors that sustainability might, but market value is based on a premise of highest and best use, which looks at the most probable buyer. 
So who would the most probable buyer be for these properties? What criteria would they use? And I think as expanded criteria comes into the market and is made more prevalent and understood better, then what will get incorporated will change. Right. But it's, it's a process. Right. And this is one of the believers in the appraisal industry talking. So, can, can I throw uh, one, yeah, one, go ahead, wrench. Gordon, by so, all means. So one wrench from a non-real estate, non-appraisal guy sitting here on the edge is we look around the world at building projects mm -hmm. or rebuilding in case of, of legacy buildings, as we call them. Um, and when you retrofit one of those legacy buildings or you're looking at new build, we look at how connected is the building. We're not just interested because we're going to sell boxes with blinky lights, but we think that there's a new business model emerging for real estate owners and developers, which is to provide additional services in the connected building relating to energy, relating to water, relating to connectivity for voice, video, and data. And if I was an appraiser 10 years out, maybe five years out, and I wanted to be relevant, I'd be doing appraisal on the basis of what's the potential value that this building can create for an owner, for an operator, or even for a tenant and an occupier who's using the, the capacity of the building and its connectedness to grow a business in the building, because there's lots of home-based home, home -based businesses uh, that can be grown in a building. And so one of the things that I'm hoping at some point this industry will do is start building into its design for retrofits or new build these kinds of factors that will make it possible to to maybe actualize the potential of a new business model for the building owner which means that rose companies might wind up being in the business of partnering with utilities as an energy services provider or a deliverer of information about energy that the utility depends on you to help them because they can't build new generating capacity. I don't think Con Ed is planning to build a whole lot more generating capacity in the greater New York metro region. So they're going to depend on you in Newark to figure out a way for them or in other, in other segments of the market, figure out a way for them to deliver better and smarter and greener energy services through the information channel that will relieve the utility of the pressure. And I don't know whether new business models can be calculated as we know it now or appraised in some way, but that's something we're certainly thinking about. I, I think your point about you know, partnerships is, is an important one. And I think one thing this industry does know how to do is, is, is partner with, with people. And, and uh, I think there are going to be new partnerships that, that, uh, that come from some of the things you're talking about. I do want to stick with the real estate a little bit and ask Suki, I'll maybe put you on the spot a little bit. You're, you're a public company. You don't necessarily care about an appraiser directly. Um, but you're, you, you have the benefit and the challenge of being marked to market every, every time you pick up the Wall Street Journal. Um, so the valuation question for your shareholders is a little different. Although there's still comparisons to NAV, and you guys look at your private valuations in terms of how you analyze what you've done, I'll give you a hypothetical, which maybe isn't too hypothetical. You talk about, again, um, what the tenants want, right? You made that comment about being tenant-driven, which is, is the right comment, clearly. But, you know, a certain multinational bank based in Germany has certain criteria about what they're going to do when they occupy a building or renew a lease. Um, you know, I certainly know firsthand everybody kind of dismisses these big elephants as not being the market because we've got to figure out how to deal with the middle of the market. But there's a lot of big elements, elephants that are sitting out there establishing very specific criteria. Um, and to me, that has to factor into valuation ultimately because you, you're, you're attracting tenants that you can apply lower credit loss assumptions to, again, higher renewal probabilities to, and yes, maybe even someday a higher rent. Um, but until we have the right tension in the market, that might be a pipe dream. But maybe comment on that. I kind of led you a little bit there, but I'm, I know you guys are thinking about that stuff. Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen two pieces of anecdotal evidence that, that the market has moved to at least some degree to evaluate this stuff a little bit differently. Um, and because we're a long-term holder, we don't, we tend over the last couple of years anyway not to sell a whole lot, but we've looked to purchase and have purchased quite a bit. Um, so the two pieces that I see coming in through my, you know, coming across my desk are kind of our existing portfolio and how it's being evaluated, particularly at the time of refinance um, and perhaps even during operations. And then the second piece is um, when we're actually procuring assets. And, and on the first end, you know, what I've seen, what we see is that rents, we don't see a delta in terms of rents, right? I can't have 
we can do a statistic, statistical analysis because half of our portfolio in New York is lead EB and half of it's not. Um, and so there we have a direct comparable that we could actually check against to see how we're doing in terms of rents um, in the last three years are not probably a good indication of, of that because it probably showed a downward slope. But um, what I would say is that what we found is over the last three years, in the same time that you know rents have suffered, um, our occupancy rates have stayed quite significant. And in that time, the number of large tenants in New York in particular, um, but it's also true of the coasts in general, um, the number of tenants that have come to New York over the last few years where their short list of items has sustainability on the mandatory list has changed. Um, and so, you know, there have been at least a few very, very large leases um, that have been signed over the last two to three years that are driving people like us to be competitive on that list. Because if you don't check the box, you don't get to the short list, right? You don't go from 10 owners to two owners in terms of leasing opportunity. You don't get, you don't get to shake hands. Um, so that's on the front end. Um, in terms of the refinance, it, it's, it's a little bit more difficult for me um, to see how the banks are evaluating it. Because we're being asked more and more at refinance time to actually include it in the package with no clarity on how it's being evaluated. Right. The flip side of that is we ask when we're actually in the process of procurement now. So when we're out looking for acquisitions, as part of the package that I get for valuation, we're looking at you know what the building infrastructure is, does it have an Energy Star rating, what do the utility bills look like, um, and that's a direct um, conversation that we have with our senior management about what the capital spend is. Right? If we buy this building, what do we need to do to it in the immediate term to make it competitive on the market? Right. Because that's where we are. Right. Seems to me that's the beginning of a new definition of investment grade real estate. Uh, we have a question out here in the audience. Hi. Um, in, the, in the last panel, um, Sean Neal mentioned risk and reward. And, and I'm just, I'm interested in, we, we seem to want to be, be saying, why, does, why doesn't the valuation community, the appraisal community, take, uh, take this into account? Um, I mean, appraisal is tr traditionally mostly historical, retrospective mm -hmm. in its analysis. It, I, I'm, I guess what I want to know is from, from Jeff, uh, from Wendy, you know, you, you seem to see value in energy efficiency retrofits, in the value adds that Gordon refers to in infrastructure. That's on a speculative basis. You're, you're hypothesizing that that will work for you. If the appraisal community took that into account, wouldn't your potential reward be decreased? Isn't, isn't it positive? It's good for you at this point that the appraisal doesn't take it into account, isn't it? Because it leaves you with more upside. Uh, see, I would argue that the appraisal probably does take it into account, but doesn't put a special name or a brand on it. If you've improved net operating income and you have put spent money on things that were otherwise deferred maintenance, you know, those are all things that long term go to the value of the building. So it doesn't matter what you call it. It's you have improved the bottom line. So it, it will go to the, it, it absolutely will affect value. I mean, I agree with uh, my panelists' comments also. I mean, Jeff was talking about it, it. We find that tenants strongly prefer being in what they perceive as being a green building. This is across asset classes. That's going to increase over time. It's actually more than about energy efficiency. It's about um, how tenant, whether, whether um, it can be validated, people believe that buildings that are green are actually healthier places to be, that there's better indoor air quality. Clearly, um, in the Class B office space, because of the way we encourage tenants to build out the space, with an open floor plan, you have more natural light. That makes people happier. So I, the, you know, we find that occupancy levels are much higher. Do we get higher rent? No, we get rent that's appropriate for that building but we certainly have much higher occupancy than our competitive set. I guess I'm, I'm thinking about it from your perspective in the acquisition phase where you might be speculating on what you sure. could do to the property rather well, than your selling right. phase when so, you would be looking so, so to realize the value. As we do exactly what Jeff talk, talked about, um, we, as part, we do very rigorous due diligence um, before we go hard on a deal and part of we look for opportunities. It's a fragmented industry. A lot of buildings are very inefficient, so there is a lot of low-hanging food, and we look for opportunities to, and that, that is certainly very much part of the play. Yeah, I think the point is that, you know, inefficiency in the market is good when you're buying. Um, it's probably not good when you already own. 
um, and because you want to get the benefit of what you're doing, either in, in the form of financing proceeds or in the form of marked up valuations or in the form of a higher sale price when you, when you exit the property. But look, I, I think that's one of the opportunities in the market that it, as people start to figure out a way to value these things, there are going to be two sides to every equation, which will make an interesting market. And uh, I think part of the argument we try to make when we're talking to people from a green print perspective and why this is important is you really shouldn't be left behind on figuring out what matters in this space because people are doing it and they're going to create, they're going to outperform the market because they're doing it. Um, do you want to be the victim in that equation going forward or do you want to be the beneficiary in that equation? But there's a whole range of things that people will agree and disagree on, which I think your point is that's maybe the good news, at least from a transaction or a market investment point of view. Jeff, do you want to add to that at all? Since no, I, I, uh, I agree with the opportunity. If there's uh, on the buy side, if the appraisal is not recognizing uh, what we believe are opportunities, then that's, that's value add that's accretive to us. Right. There's no question. Yeah. Thank and you. I think just in terms of the appraisal, I, I don't mean to pick on the appraisal industry. I, I think the challenge is really around equity valuations. And everybody's on this panel is in some form or another in the business of doing equity valuations. Um, and so it's not just the appraisers. Um, uh, and the comment about it being a rear-looking analysis, I've been hearing that for decades. And on, on one hand, I agree with it because people, the, the appraisers look for data to support their assumptions. But meanwhile, every appraisal I've ever looked at in the last 30 years is primarily based on a 10-year forecast of cash flows and discounting those back. And so. Yeah, it may be backward looking in terms of the, you know, some of the factual assumptions that may be on the front end in terms of rent, but in terms of, of where those cash flows are going to go, it's all about forecasting and speculation. And, you know, you know I, I think you know, these things have to be factored in. And everybody who sits at their desk thinking about, you know, whether, whether an investment decision makes sense or not is doing the same thing. Um, and so it's not just the appraisers that, that need to think forward, incorporate things. It's clearly the investors and the owners that do, too. You have the good fortune of having a group of people up here that have already figured that out. As we do these things going forward, I'm a big advocate of getting some people on these panels that actually don't believe it works so we can actually really get into the nitty gritty of, of uh, you know, the other side of the argument. So we've tried to do that a little bit here today. Other questions from the audience? I know we're running low on time and we're between you and the exit doors at some point uh, here soon, but we'd be happy to hear from you. I actually have a uh, question in terms of user occupancy for commercial. Uh, Betty, you, you and I went over that the other day last night, and I was wondering if there's any data that you see that as a real estate broker, how can I go to a large tenant and tell them, if you move into this new class A building, pay 15, 20% higher than another building, how can green technology justify that? Is there any? type of data out there in terms of health, mental, anything at all? Um, a lot of mental health. I, I, I'm yeah. going to defer uh, to Gordon on, on the technology part, but there is definitely data. I will agree with Wendy. I don't necessarily see higher rates being paid currently. I see top of the market rents. I see better tenant retention, less downtime between leases, that uh, a higher renewal probability, which all flows to the bottom line and is beneficial. But I also see 20-year, um, there's a great example in Portland, Oregon, 20-year-old building, 95-plus percent occupancy always. They have a recycling program. They have a whole community around one office building because of the way that it's managed. So, I mean, their tenant retention is at the top and one of the best places to be, but it's, it's a whole package, not just one thing. Technology, I'll, I'll let him take it. We do measure everything, and so we try to get our real estate portfolio managers who are Cisco employees or our, our consultants and advisors at JLL to help us make judgments about whether there is a productivity bump that is obtained. Uh, we know that for a fact because we measure everything, including how often people are using their computers at their desks or from home or from a third location. Uh, so we have 70,000 people, and we've deployed all of our technologies and partner technologies in our office buildings and in the residence, like my residence, so that I can be connected always. And so we do have data. Um, we're not, you know, a tenant of, 
of ourselves because we don't own our buildings. We're a tenant of a third party. I'm not sure we're sharing the data with the building owners, but we're definitely using the data internally to help us sort out what's working, what's being used. Uh, we've published some white papers and case studies that you can find on our website and uh, you know, just type in urban innovation at the, at the cisco.com website and you'll see some things that we published about best practices that we've discovered using ourselves as guinea pigs and now we're, we're offering that data to the world including companies in the real estate development business. I think one of the things I'd add to the, to the answer, and, and, and maybe uh, Suki would have a, an additional comment here, but I think, Jack, I can't quite read your name tag, but I assume you're a broker based on the question you asked. Okay. Right. I think it's a great question. I think the brokerage community in particular plays a huge role uh, in what we're talking about. And as we talk about future panels, having, having a, a broker's perspective on this I think is important. I, I think the brokerage community has an opportunity and a responsibility in many ways. I mean, the, one of the basic fundamentals to good brokerage is knowing your customer, you know, and I, I would say that that question should be asked of the broker's customer in, in, in great detail in terms of what really matters to you. And obviously some of the big players, the big occupiers, that Cisco certainly is a big occupier of space, Deutsche Bank is a big occupier of space, um, those users have answers to that question in terms of worker productivity, in terms of what light and air means to their, to, to their formula for, for, for quality office space and a quality work experience. So uh, I think we do need to get the brokers to really play a role here and really understand what the customers are saying. And I think as typical, the, the mid, middle and small guys follow the big guys. When the standards get created for quality office experience by the big guys who can afford to do it and have the negotiating leverage to do it, the middle market, I think at least, I don't know if you guys agree, you know, it just follows along because that again becomes the definition of what's, you know, what's an office opportunity or an office experience that commands the best rent. And it may not be the highest rent, but I think in some ways it'll be the difference between rent and no rent, which is sort of an important way to look at it too. The only thing I'll add to that is I'm not gonna presuppose what brokers are or aren't marketing to potential tenants, but I will say that at our budget meeting every year, our president asks for common area per square foot numbers in terms of what our utility spend is. And there's a wide range, right? So let's say it's $1.50 to $4.50 per square foot for common area charges that we're, that's our range across the country. And he, he asks what the difference is, right? What's the difference between a $1.50 building and a $4.50 building? And to my mind, that's what tenants should be asking and that's what brokers should be providing the answer to. Okay, we're uh, more or less on schedule here. I want to thank you all for your attention late in the day. We've enjoyed it. Thank you, panelists, for coming prepared. And enjoy. It's really, it's exciting for, for someone who's been kind of, for people, for those of us who've been kind of involved with these discussions, just to see how much it's elevated over the past few years. Uh, you know, the, the fact, the discussions about energy efficiency and green building are just at a completely different level. And the bad side of that, I guess, is that the more information we have, the more questions we have, but I think we're figuring that out. And the one thing the panel didn't do was answer the question, is there a link between energy performance and investment performance? I think the answer is there should be, and we're figuring it out, you know, we're proving it slowly and shortly. Um, yes, yeah, so hopefully we'll have some more data next year and we'll, we'll give you the definitive answer. But uh, I'd also, if you could, just uh, thank me again, thank you, join me in thanking our, our co-chairs, uh, uh, Chuck, Relina, and Susan, and our, all of our sponsors. Thank you very much for, for making all this possible. And just in the last uh, thank yous, I have to thank the NYU Shackett Center of Real Estate Events team, especially Jessica Watson, Milton Scudder, and Catherine Green, who really made all of this possible. So Jessica, especially thank you very much. Um, this is all very much, this, as you could tell, uh, very much the start of the conversation, uh, certainly not the end of it uh, by any stretch. We will, uh, we will kind of continue. This will all be available for you to look at on YouTube, which will be great. We'll have a video of all of this and records of all this. And just keep an eye out for some of the, uh, the studies that are coming out of local Law 84 data. I think there should be a lot of interesting information coming out over the next few months to kind of help build some of this discussion and move it from anecdotal to, to hopefully getting some more hard evidence as we go over the next few years. So I want to thank you all again and uh, appreciate you spending the day with us and uh, have, a, have a safe afternoon. Thanks very much.